turn to number 18. Come we that love the Lord, let's sing the first, third, and fifth verse. I was scheduled to be here on that uh, uh, that snowy morning, <laughs> right, Alvin? That you called me, and uh, uh, it'd been a little slippery that day, but uh, so at least we just got a little fog today. But I'm glad to be back uh, back with you today. So um, let's share in a, in a prayer and uh, lead into the the Lord's prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are grateful for the privilege that we have to come together. Even as the, uh, the weather may be a little foggy as it's been for the, the past week, we, we thank you, God, for uh, the clarity of, of who you are and help us to, uh, to see you and experience you as we come to worship today. Thank you, God, for each of these uh, followers of yours as we gather today. May we truly sense that you are, are present in our midst as we seek to worship you and give you thanks for that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive as we forgive those who is not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. The Lord bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Amen. Shall we pray together the prayer of confession? O Lord, we bring you our hearts and minds as reasonable living gifts. Take us as we are and forgive us when we fail to be all that you want us to be. Bless us with the spiritual power we truly need. We are yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I belong to God. Our love for each other will last forever. I can respond to God with all my energy. I will put away things that separate me from God. I need God. Enjoy God now and forever. Amen. Is anybody uh, just longing to share some special music this morning? Well, I don't see any, uh, any younger children here, but we're all children of God. So my wife has a message for us anyway. Right, Sue?
Have you ever wondered what God is like? If you could talk to him right now, what would you like to say? Or what question would you ask? Well, they're thinking real hard. I can tell. <laughs> well, to help you, I've got a few things that kids have said. If Jesus didn't have a sister, why do I have to have one? Are you really invisible, or is it just a trick? Here's one from my son. Does God have a belly button? Please, change the taste of asparagus. Did you mean for the giraffe to look that way? Or was it an accident? I went to a wedding and they kissed right in church. Is that okay? Thank you for my baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. We could go on and on, but let's end with a sweet thought from a little boy who said, it's great how you always get the stars in the right place. I thought those were really good. While we may not know all that we'd like to know about God right now, here are just a few things that we find in the Bible that we do know. First of all, in Proverbs 15:3, it tells us God is everywhere. So he's here in church with us this morning. Even though we don't see him, he is here. Number two, from John 3:16. God loved the world so much, and that includes you and me, that he gave Jesus to us. Number three, he listens when we pray. And Isaiah 65, 24 tells us he answers even before we pray. That's awesome to think about, isn't it? He's already answered some things you've never asked him yet. He forgives us when we make wrong choices. That blessing comes from Psalm 86, 5. And he has all power. He's big enough to handle anything that we might need. He's a great God, isn't he? And knowing these things about him, we can certainly put our trust and our faith in him. Let's do our echo prayer. Repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God thank you for being such an awesome God. Amen. Please share with me our uh, responsive reading that we have from, uh, from Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Do we have any uh, special uh, uh, prayer concerns this morning? 
Carol has mentioned uh, the death of her husband's uh, father and Delbert, and uh, you may have others that ought to be lifted in prayer. Well, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, you are concerned about us. You're such an awesome God, and sometimes we may think of you as being distant from us, but you care very deeply for each one of us. You care for those things that concern us. You care for our health and well-being. You care for our, our families, those who are near and, and far off as well. You care for our community, and uh, you care for people that love you and know you and serve you, and those who have yet to come to know of your love and care. Lord, uh, help us to be those uh, messengers, messengers of love and compassion to those around us, even in our own community, who may not have a, a relationship with the living God yet. We thank you, God, for outreach beyond our local church and community. We thank you, God, for the, the work of uh, missionaries uh, around our country and around the globe that share the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Through teaching, through uh, ministering to uh, needs of, of hunger and health and provisions of homes, we thank you, God, that you are concerned about us. Lord, we, uh, we pray for those who, who mourn. We pray for uh, Dave's family and the uh, loss of his father. And Lord, each of us go through periods of, uh, of loss. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the privilege that we have of uh, your comfort, your strength, your care for each and every one of us. Lord, guide us as, uh, as your servants. I thank you, God, for this congregation and the privilege I have to uh, proclaim your word here from time to time. Continue to give wisdom and discernment to each of those who are in positions of, of leadership here, that this church may continue to be a, a lighthouse of, of your love and compassion in this community and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, you have a, a number of uh, announcements in your, uh, in your bulletin. Uh, any of those that need to be highlighted or uh, some that uh, aren't printed here that uh, should be shared? Well, let's move on to our, our hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See.
seated. From Matthew 23, we read these words. Then said Jesus to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by men, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at the feast and the best seats in the synagogue and salutations in the marketplace and being called rabbi by men. But you're not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all one brethren. And call no man your father on earth, for you're, you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called masters, for you have one master, the Christ, who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted." May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, as we come to your word today, we'd ask that your Holy Spirit, that caused these words to be penned, that caused these words to be uh, brought to us, saved, that we might uh, hear them, that we might uh, seek to live according to the teachings of your word. And so, Lord, we'd ask for the illumination of, of your Holy Spirit upon your word, upon our understanding, upon our seeking to put your truth into practice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In his book, The Root of the Righteous, A.W. Tozer wrote, Satan's first attack on the human race was his sly effort to destroy Eve's confidence in the kindness of God. Unfortunately for her and for us, Satan succeeded too well. From that day, men have had a false concept of God. And it is exactly that that has taken out from under them the ground of righteousness and driven them to reckless and destructive living. End of quote. My friends here this morning, I believe that Tozer is right. And I believe that Satan is still working hard to get us to doubt that God really wants to provide what is best for you and for me. Satan wants to win the battle. And sometimes he succeeds by getting people to have a distorted concept of God. 22 years ago, I had the awesome privilege of of, of taking our, our older daughter, Rachel, with me. When I went to teach young men and women in a seminary class in Managua, Nicaragua, I helped train students for Christian ministries as as pastors and and missionaries in, in that very poor country. My awesome task was teaching their very first seminary class. It was called Theology Proper. 
Basically, this theology class was designed to help them have a proper, sound, biblical concept of God and God's character. And at the beginning of that, one of my clear tasks was to clear up their misconceptions. And so let's think about that for a moment. Some people think of God as being very stern and austere, a harsh taskmaster who's very distant from them. God may be looked upon as a mean old ogre who's made up many, many rules to keep us from enjoying life. Have you ever heard people describe God that way? I have. Such false concepts of God cannot help but adversely affect one's relationship with God. With such a distorted notion of God, one might reason that if they are never going to please God anyway, why should they even bother to try? And therefore many, many don't try, and they end up wasting their lives. I certainly hope and believe that, 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 at least for most of us, we realize that God's words and God's rules are not to keep us from enjoying life, but to give us the best life and to keep us from harming ourselves and others. High moral standards are, are for our own good. The Pharisees of whom Jesus spoke in the Gospels thought of God as being stern and austere. However, in spite of, uh, of this wrong concept of God, they did maintain a fairly high level of external morality but this so-called righteousness was only outward for them. Listen to Jesus' description of them in, in Matthew 23 and in verses that are beyond what we read in our text this morning. Blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside. But the inside is full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to be people as righteous, but on the inside you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You see, my friends, uh, the Pharisees as a whole did, did not see God as, as loving. They did not see God as uh, the loving father. They did not see God as uh, desiring his best for his people. For them, the law of God was not the law of, G law of love as Jesus told us that it was. Earlier in Matthew, in some of the verses that I previously shared with you, we, we read the, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy burdensome loads 
and put them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. You know, there may have been as many as 613 Jewish commandments. Now, we, we can get different numbers as we, as we study the scriptures and things about the scriptures, but that's a lot of commandments, isn't it? So serving God was looked upon as bondage rather than a response to God's love. If we think of God as cold and exacting, we shall find it difficult, probably, perhaps even impossible to really love God the way we should. Instead, our lives might be lived in unholy fear. However, if we understand God as being kind and understanding, our inner life is likely to reflect this concept. There seem to be many people today, including some Christians, who are plagued with an improper concept of, of God, and as a result of that, they live very unhappy lives. They don't look like they're enjoying God or their relationship with God or their relationship with other people. We might consider the example of the older brother in the familiar parable of the prodigal son. Now, I prefer to call that the, the parable of the loving father because the wayward son came home and his father's arms were outstretched with love to receive him back. But if we look at that story, that parable, we, we also see that older brother wasn't, wasn't interested in receiving his wayward brother home, was he? When Christians live like this, they misrepresent our just and holy God of love. So let's move beyond these misconceptions, and there could be many more, to look at some proper concepts of God. Of course, the, the Bible is our, our best reference. And you know that. It helps us learn and practice proper concepts concerning God. Of course, some of us may have study Bibles that have all kinds of additional helps. We may have commentaries and, and other resources that are, are available to assist us in having sound biblical concepts of God. Two of the excellent resources that I took with me when I went to Nicaragua were God Discover His Character by Bill Bright, and Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Now certainly there are many, many other resources, and these are, are old ones. You may have some newer ones. But you know, there may also be some resources that are not quite so trustworthy because they're not based on the truth of Scripture. I'm assuming that many of you, perhaps all of you, can think of, of three words that we seldom use that describe the character of God that is unique to God. Omnipresence refers to uh, the fact that God is present everywhere at the same time. You and I aren't able to do that, are we? God is able to do that because God is spirit. 
So he's present everywhere. He's not limited to a physical body as, as you and I happen to be. In Jeremiah we read, Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and a God who is not far off? Can a person hide himself in hiding places so that I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? Words from Jeremiah 23. The word omnipotence speaks of the awesome power of God, the nature of God. Isaiah wrote, to whom then will you compare me? that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. Raise your eyes on high and see who he who has created the stars, the one who, who brings out their multitude by number. He calls them by name. Because of his greatness, the greatness of his might, and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. From Isaiah 40. Omniscience describes the fact that God knows everything. He knows you and me better than we know ourselves. John wrote that God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. In 1 John 3.20. Of course, my friends, these, these Bible verses that I've shared in the last couple of moments are, are just a few of many that describe these unique attributes of God. Do you really know God described in the Holy Scriptures? Do you really know our God described as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God created our world and all that is. Our God is, is holy, he's righteous, he's kind, he's patient and loving. And because of this, God has created you and me for fellowship with himself. Now, because he's holy and just, he cannot and he will not condone sin. So it's against God's very nature to tolerate sin, even though he loves us sinners. And you know that all of us are sinners. God, not you and I, determines what is right and wrong. Sinful behavior may be unhealthy and destructive. But through the blood of the everlasting covenant, God is able to treat us as if we have never sinned when we repent and receive him as our Savior. What a joy it is to really know God and to experience his cleansing and his indwelling presence. You and I can really only love because God first loved us. Jesus surrendered his will to his heavenly Father 
for our salvation. And when we trust him and strive with his help to do his will, he's very pleased with us. The scriptures tell us that that Jesus came into the world to serve and to lay down his life for us because of his great love for us. No one has shown greater love for you and for me than God sending his son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God created us. God knows us better than than we know ourselves. He knows we're made of dust and have human weaknesses. Yes, God may chasten us when we fall, but he does even this with the love of a father. Have you ever thought about how we might picture God as a loving father? If that's not been our experience, There are people around us who, who grow up with, without knowing a father that really loves them and cares about them. In preparation for my trip to Nicaragua, one of the historical things that I discovered was way back In the 1500s, criminals were sent to this little fledgling country. And these criminals populated the place, biologically fathering many children with many women, and yet not taking the role of a father. Some of these children down through the generations had a difficult time understanding the concept of a loving father because their father was only a biological father. He he wasn't there in their home sharing love and compassion. And while we may think about that being far away, that happens in our own land as well, my friends. So think about the the awesome privilege that hopefully most of us have had of an earthly father and mother that loved and cared for us. That may have been a part of our spiritual development. And those of us who have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ have the privilege to share God's love with others so that they may come to know and experience our great God. Our great God that is almost beyond description, but we can try, as I've tried in these few moments this morning. So what is your concept of God? How would you describe God? If you were asked, if you're asked by a a, a fellow Christian, or maybe even one who didn't know much about God, how would you describe God? 
What is your concept of God? I believe it's vitally important to the way that you and I live. I close with another quote from A.W. Tozer. He says, we please him most, not by frantically trying to make ourselves good, but by throwing ourselves into his arms with all our imperfections and believing that he understands everything and loves us still. Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, God, for our finite understanding of that. We thank you for your magnificent character. And we would ask, God, that you would help us to draw ever close to you. Well, we're not om omniscient, omnipotent, or omnipresent. And these things seem so distant from us. We thank you, God, that you have come in the person of Jesus Christ so that we might have a personal relationship with you and walk with you. And so, Lord, guide us Help us by your spirit to be the men and women that you have called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue our, our worship today, we know that our, our giving of our love offerings and, and tithes are a part of our worship. And so we invite you to, uh, to give. God, we are grateful that you are a giving God. You have given yourself. You have given your all for us. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to give a small portion of with that with which you have blessed us to carry on your work. May it truly be an expression of our love and devotion to you and to your church and to your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let's share together in a, another great old hymn, Wonderful Words of Life. Bye. 
blessed one gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. We echo the gospel call. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>